It's time now to go to the press and see what the headlines are this morning. And we're being joined by architect Ezekiel Nyaitoke, a public affairs analyst who is talking with us or who is joining us from Akwaibom State. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Very good morning to you and, uh, of course, the Plus TV family and Nigerians. <laughs> Okay. Now, um, we'll take our first paper. We're beginning from the Punch newspaper. CBN orders banks to sell excess dollars in 24 hours. Banks, okay, the writer is, banks may sell $5 billion, uh, says official, and Cardoso faces Senate Tuesday over Naira Fall. So let's hear what you think. You see, the issue of the dollar and the Naira and the banks and the government is an issue that Nigerians should pay more than a passing interest because running of government, the first person on the top of the ladder is what you call the office of the citizen. That's the very, very first person. I hope, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, yes, okay. The very, very first person is the office of the citizen before you now have government where the presidency or the executive sits on top and you have the legislature and the judiciary. So the very first person responsible for the welfare and well-being of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is the office of the citizen. That is from that office that you choose government that's what makes elections so important such that the government you choose is on account of what the citizens had decided and where you think that the processes are not okay you sit up and you speak up now that said what is happening with the naira and the central bank and the government is what the citizens should come in on two ways one, to say, nope, it's unacceptable, I don't accept it. And two, to also offer constructive, not only criticisms, but also solutions. For where we are today, why is the dollar, the dollar hitting Nigeria left, right, and uh, the Naira left, right, and center? Because number one, we are not having inflow. So the question is, why are we not having inflow? Number two, our demands are too high. And the question is, why are demands too high? Number three, they are the fifth columnists, the speculators. And here, government officials, politicians, and bankers are the number one culprit. When we sit down, if the central bank has come out, it has one, two, three instruments at its disposal. Number one, what will we not make foreign um, um, exchange available to in Nigeria? Even if you can afford it, no, we don't want it. What can we say about that? Number two, we have a lot of domiciliary accounts with the dollars of Nigerians there. It is their money. But what sort of sweetness, what sort of incentives, what sort of measures can we put in place such that that Nigerian will willingly want to bring out? Don't tell me, look, it's a mindset thing. Don't say oh, it's not possible. Mm -mm. Don't start with it's not possible. It is possible. All we need is a man. If I need a, a, a foreign insurance to <coughs> work with them, I was listening to the Minister of Aviation yesterday talking about, you know, getting a kind of insurance such that if you miss your flight, they will be able to get you another ticket on the spot and we get the insurance to write off that and take it out later. There are creative thinkings. How can we make Nigerians to bring out their dollars back into the system so that there is a comfort that you will not lose that your Naira uh, dollar value at the end of the day? Can we get an international insurance since we don't, we've learned not to trust ourselves again? And then, of course, the central bank has the capacity to know the banking dollar stock of every bank, and they should interrogate, which is the first step they have taken. 
I believe that's a very good step in the right direction and that Nigerians should applaud that. But then let us look for how we can create a governance structure that the citizens can have some level of faith and confidence in because we keep to contracts. Okay. Um, on the top left corner of the Punch newspaper, the, um, the front page of the Punch newspaper, we have Tinubu directs AGF, Lopobiri, to end one point. Three billion dollar oil block dispute. <laughs> There's a lot of um, speculations here and there. When the president said he was going to um, a private visit, you know, to France, a lot of things came in here and there and. Um, well, um, one of the speculations is that um, there's um, going to be a, a sweetener of a deal where Oando might be a beneficiary of, you know. So when the president says, oh, settle this, um, we want to see some level of transparency and accountability. And let me say this, that Oando ownership has a relationship with the president does not mean that there are less Nigerians than any other Nigerian. But... The government, because of perception being stronger than reality, has an, you know, that, uh, what's the word, that overriding um, compulsion, not compulsion, it, 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 it's incumbent upon them, it's mandatory, it is obligatory, that's the word I wanted to get. It's obligatory on them to ensure that even if Owando is a beneficiary, an objective Nigerian would say, they deserve it because the level of transparency, even there's a way you lose an election and you congratulate the winner yourself. I remember there was a balloting I did somewhere for houses and things like that. And those who lost went and congratulated those who won because the level of transparency was such that even the worst of skeptics could not doubt it. So I think that this government, they should understand the concept of emotional intelligence and then know exactly how to do what they want to do. Uh, that is what I will say about that, because it, it, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of controversy, a lot of this. But I want to say that if you are a relation of Mr. President, you are no less Nigerian and you are no less entitled so long as Mr. President operates on principle principles of fairness, of equity, of transparency, of accountability, of openness, which is what transparency in the first place is all about. Once that is done, what's fair is fair. And whoever is in business, whether it's related to him or not related to him, whoever wins fair and square should be allowed to enjoy the spoils, if I may use that language. Yeah, I don't know how much spoils we are going to enjoy when we have an economy whose uh, currency is uh, over five, 1,500 naira to the dollar. I don't know what you, you think about that. The dollar has dropped to an all-time low, more than 1,500. I'll tell you, my brother, let me tell you, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. And I say this with every sense of responsibility. If the presidency wants to get us doing well. Yeah, I know as a private citizen, I run an office. I've never worked for anybody all my life. So I'm a businessman. I understand the concept of the fundamentals and the dynamics and the essence and the foundations, the primaries. And these are the fundamentals you apply when you want to get results. I'll say this, you know, not long ago, I made up my mind to support this government. I am not in APC. We seem to have lost the audio of uh, architect Ezekiel Nyaitok. We're hoping that he will reconnect with us and continue the analysis. We're looking at newspaper headlines and we're just talking about the fact that the Naira is above 1,500 Naira to the dollar. 
as we speak. And uh, if this continues, I don't know how much business we can do in this country and how much more we can take what is happening. The economy is so bad, the Senate has decided to um, invite the central bank governor, Cardoso, to face them on Tuesday next week. And we are looking forward to what that meeting will bring. The revelations, hopefully, that we will find out uh, about in, the, in, the, in that meeting or after that meeting, what is really happening. Why is the Naira uh, having this kind of free fall? Why is the economy so biting that the people are suffering and all that? We hear that money has been saved. Uh, from uh, fuel subsidy removal and so many other loopholes that have been blocked. And we hear uh, humongous amounts being uh, peddled here and there. But we do not know what really is happening, why the common man is not enjoying what he should okay. enjoy. We are glad to be reconnected with uh, architect Ezekiel Nyaitok. Sorry that we lost your audio at some point. Please continue. We're talking about the Naira yes. that has fallen you. so low. Yeah. You see, what I'm saying is this. When you, they are setting fundamentals and basics for an economy to thrive. They are not rocket science. One of such fundamentals is peace and stability. Like I said before, I, 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 I lost um, connection. I am a Nigerian, so I have decided to support this government in every way practically possible. I will criticize where there's need. I'll look for solutions and provide. And I was on a station yesterday and um, one of the national stations. And, and the question came up that has to do with, with patriotism and, and nationalism. And I said, look, I am not in APC, but I will do everything possible to make sure that the presidency works and the government. I'm not in PDP and my state government is PDP. I will support my governor to the highest level because the betterment of my, 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 my state or my country is in my larger interest. Why am I saying that? It is that this fall of the Naira is not in the interest of Nigeria. And that whatsoever is possible for this government to do, they have to do it. And there are things that I can suggest that they should do. Number one, I hope you are still hearing me. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. I okay, hear great, you, yes. great. Number one is the speculators, which I've said before. One, the banks. Within the banks, what is the stock of the dollars within the bank? What is the ownership structure of the dollars within the bank? There are two sets of owners. One is the average Nigerian that has worked hard and built his um, or her, you know, savings within the system, no matter how much it is. And the other is the proceeds of crime, which a lot of times have to do with the contracts within banks and governments that the bankers know. Let EFCC interrogate with the central bank and then... For the criminals that you cannot explain, let that money be brought out. And then you come. If you cannot explain, then you are, there's got to be something to be done. But for the sincere owners that we can tell how the money... You know, yeah, you know I, I, let me just quickly say this. I'm in a committee right now um, to look into housing. And yesterday, the chairman of that committee said something. He said, in this committee... We are going to be extremely transparent, accountable, every single dime, every cover that is spent. Secretary, from the ministry, you must give explanation for any payment. We went for a meeting and a private account was used to send some money. There was a very good explanation. It made a whole lot of sense. But the, 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 the chairman said, as from today... We should use the ministry account, number one. Number two, if there is anything that has to be done, there must be a letter that explains. And number three, all payments must be very clearly stated. And at the end of the day, we will be able to say this committee spent five million and account for it. Because a lot of times in other places, 
Ministry of Housing is different. They are very organized and very, very, um, whatever. They are very um, corruption uh, sensitive. So, especially with the new minister. So, they are very transparent. But in other agencies, you realize that the budget for that event is 200 million. Whereas the expenditure in real terms is about less than 50 million. What happened to the other more than 150 million? It gets into voicemail. So we want to start by bringing this, you know, uh, principles of accountability, of transparency. If the banks can come and give us a clear ownership structure of all our dollars, that is, they are in custody of, a lot of money will start to come out. And if Central Bank, between Central Bank and the Federal Ministry of Finance, if they are honest and sincere, I can tell you that in less than one month the dollar can find itself going below a thousand uh, uh, naira to a dollar i can tell you that for free then will the governor will the governor of central bank and the president of the federal republic of nigeria will he have the political will to engage the northern elite elites i, I want to you know maybe i shouldn't uh, profile uh, because uh, though you may think of it better i mean might be uh, inexpedient for me to profile. Will they look at the people that speculate with dollars, with the CBDs, and really come to sit down with them and say, can we have an honest conversation and see how we can rescue this country? I believe that if they have that honest conversation, the hawking of the dollars left, right, and center I've looked around it, and maybe I've not gone around enough, but I've gone around the world. I don't see where the dollar is sold anyhow, or the pound is sold anywhere. It's like you just go and pick and... I, I haven't seen it. Why is it so in Nigeria? There are institutions, Bureau of the Change, they are there. There are places you go to. I've traveled wide enough. And once I want to exchange money, there are certain places you go to. When you go there, they will take your passport, they will tell you what you need, and then they'll be able to do the transaction. Everything is recorded. By the time I get into America or Europe or uh, any of these places, they can tell, they can relatively track the amount of money I've spent and how I spent it and the thing. But in Nigeria, I can walk down the street and buy $100,000 off the radar, completely off record, no documentation, nothing. And is this what we want? Why is it still so? Is it a government policy that it's okay? Is the government turning a blind eye on it? The time has come when we must have an honest conversation with ourselves in this country. Mm. Okay, uh, this one is uh, sweet. Amid insecurity, NEF or Haneze CSOs angry over Tinubu's private trip to Paris. And one of the, the writer is, he is on top of the situation, says presidency. This is on Daily Trust newspaper. Ohaneze NEF CSOs angry over Tinubu's private trips, uh, private trip to Paris. Uh, amid all the problems that we have in Nigeria, the president decided to go on a private visit to France. And this is, uh, this is worrisome to a lot of people uh, in Nigeria. What do you think about yeah. that? Yeah. It's not on leave, it's not you know, on anything, this, this but it's on the, private, on the private visit with state funds, possibly. You know, um, this issue also came up on the national discourse that I was on yesterday again. And, um, you know, I had made up my mind to work for um, Obong Tinubu. But you see, it should not be blindly and it should be not be stupidly. When I come on a national setup like this, they expect me to talk as a nationalist. They expect me to be very, very objective. Uh, and I, I said it yesterday and um, it was it was concord that I, I have, at the risk of sounding immodest, one of the highest ratings in public discourse whenever I come up. And that's because people expect a certain level of, of, of 
of openness and objective disposition from me. So my making up my mind to work as much as possible for the president is not going to make me in any way to say that black is white. I'll never do that. I think there's no emotional intelligence and I don't know who the advisors of Mr. President is for what is happening today for president to proceed on private visits. Now, a man like Palano has said that there's no provision in the, in the Constitution for private visits of, of a president. I can understand when he proceeds on leave, if that happens, he has his liberty to do certain things. But when you go with the private, with the, with, the, with the jet of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, go with the retinue of people that are paid, I'm probably still getting a star code, I'm not sure of that, and you call, call that a private visit? No, it's not. That is on one hand. But what is more worrisome is the time. The Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. I think that the president has allowed Two people commented, you know, on his travel abroad. One person was Obong Atiku, and the other person was Obong Obi. Now, you realize that, you know, while Obong Atiku is saying, look, if the heat is too much, get out of the kitchen, you know, me, Obong Obi, on the other hand, is saying, fellow Nigerians, this is a time for us to come together because we are in a desperate situation to drop our political caps and help this nation. And he went further to go and visit the family uh, of uh, one of the families, I believe, of, 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 of the kidnapped victims. This guy's rating just went through the roof. Nigerians started to say, wow, because they could see the emotional connection at a time that Mr. President was absent. It's not good for him politically. It's not good for our nation. At a time like this, we need our father to be on top of the situation, assuring us, reassuring us, moving into theaters of war, being a commander-in-chief, and being, you know, the father of the nation. So on the insecurity, he's a commander-in-chief. On those who are mourning, he's the father of the nation. That is what governance is all about. People who tell him that it doesn't matter, they don't like him. Telling me that, no, he's on top of the situation. What I mean, I mean, do I sound, do, you, do I look like somebody who, who has nothing between my ears? Don't, don't tell me that, you know? So I understand there could be situations where des desperate measures demands for him to rush out and rush back. I can understand that. But when you are out for two weeks at a time like this, insecurity has never been this bad. Naira has never been this battered. Who is talking to me? Just an address to the nation based on one, two, three things that I can even tell him the lines to put. Number one, technically shut down this country. Gentlemen, the time has come when we have to take desperate measures because of where we are. We are in a war situation. We are in an emergency situation. We are shutting, technically shutting down this country. Let's sit down here and face the situation ourselves and tell ourselves the, the simple truth and look into our eyes and decide what we want from, our, from, from us. This is the time that Mr. President will say, in the process, I am relocating the seat of government from this um, Abuja to the southeast. The next two weeks... I'm going to be operating in the southeast, and I need to know why they have to sit at home every Monday for God knows how long. I need to know what the problem is. I don't want to be told again. I want to see it. And just that statement alone, boom. Do you know that the first thing is that, that south, sit at home thing, he sits down, engages the people, and then he's able to come up with practical solutions, reassure them, and then he makes a broadcast. We want to thank God for what we've achieved so far in the southeast. Now, the next two weeks, I'm moving to the northeast. I need to know I may be there for up to a month because this issue of kidnapping, this issue of foreign terrorists has to come to an end. I am going to be there. My brother, within three months maximum, there will be peace in Nigeria. All ministers cancel all foreign trips, cancel all engagements, we cannot be bringing investors when the foundation is weak, when we cannot be assured the people. And then, while at the central bank governor, 
and um, you know, uh, 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 Attorney General sit down and work out this issue of our contracts with other people, our obligations. We need to be a country that believes in the rule of the judiciary. I need to know, please, come up with something. I need desperate whatever. In the next three months, we need to take very hard, decisive decisions to lay a foundation for a Nigeria that works. This is what I swore to the uh, constitution to do, and that is what I took an oath of office to do, and that is what I'm going to do. When we see that, bro, say, I can give my life for it to tell you that this country will start to move in the direction that we'll be proud of. Nigeria is a country that has all it takes to be on top of the game. Okay, uh, well... Uh now we're talking insecurity and all that and then EFCC has come up in one forum that was held recently and said that a religious sect is laundering money for terrorists uh, what do you have to say that's still on daily trust the same headline can be found in the Guardian newspaper uh, where they said EFCC traces seven billion naira to religious bodies alleges faith leaders laundering funds for terrorists you know on one hand, I'm sad. On one hand, I'm relatively optimistic. And on one hand, I'm almost confused. Why am I sad? I'm sad that religious bodies that are expected to be the custodians of the do-rightness concept especially the Christian religion, because I know that. And when the Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation, it means do rightness exalts a nation. It is not about the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, no. That is why an Arab nation, countries that have multiple gods, talk of a place like India, they prosper. Talk of a place like the United Arab Republic, they prosper because these are statutes of general application. Do rightness exalt a nation. And the Christian religion that I know, the Christian faith, is a major principal custodian of do rightness. If that body that EFCC is referring to is a Christian body, then I'm ashamed of such a body. And if Christians are part of that system. I'm ashamed of any of such people because that should not be the case. But I have friends enough within the Muslim world who give me an idea of what the Muslim religion is all about and what it stands. And I can say with every sense of responsibility that if there is any Muslim sect that is implicated or is complicit, then they should be ashamed of themselves because they are a terrible representation of, of the Muslim religion. I'll say that makes me sad. The second part of it that gets me confused is that the EFCC chairman, is he afraid? If he comes across this, maybe they are still doing investigations, so let me not preempt them. But I expect them to do a watertight investigation and put some people in the dock and make a public show of them. Even in the Bible, Jesus made a public show of them, you know, triumphing over them in it. There's a time that wisdom demands that you call out these people, you name and you shame, so that others can dissociate themselves from, from such people. So I'm confused about that. And I'm hoping that EFCC will not just be telling us, hey, these people are causing problems, hey, this, we know them. We don't want to hear that. We want to see action. But then I have a ray of hope that they can openly come out and say this. Because they should expect that there will be a backlash of people saying, so what are you doing? So I believe that this is step one. And it gives me hope to know that there will be a step two. Because that time has come when we must do differently because doing the same thing the same way will always give us the same results outside of which sort an expectation is nothing but the definition of insanity if we want to get a different result efcc 
from the talk, talk, talk of the past, then they start to do what they've not been doing in the past. And we will be there as their great cheerleaders, you know, clapping for them. And my prayer, my faith, my hope today is that what the chairman said yesterday is step one. And that by tomorrow, well, tomorrow being figurative, we'll be able to see step two, but not the endless tomorrow that never comes, like the youth are leaders of tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Now, they um, say. there is this, uh, still on security, monarchs killing. Uh, Oni, judge, call for community policing, input of ex-service chiefs. This community policing uh, has, has become an issue, and we've been talking about it day in, day out. I don't know why the government is dragging its feet. And then we find states and uh, geopolitical regions in Nigeria forming security blocks within their, their, their geopolitical zones. And I don't know what the marked difference of this is from having a state police that will even be controlled by uh, the constitution and everything. Because when you allow people to resort to self-help, there's a possibility that some of the laws guiding um, a formation of something like that may not be uh, adhered to. Because this is self-help, whether we like it or not. Amotekun is self-help. The Hizba up north is self-help. And every other one that has come up is self-help. We keep talking about state policing, and then there are other schools of thought that say that state policing is not good just because the f there's this fear that the governors might use them to their own benefit. I, I don't know. Let's still talk about this state policing. What do you still think about state policing? I was, I was on a television program, and I thought I was saying something really, really good. I got a call, a block number. Eutuekong, that's, that's the title I have. It's like Are on Akakan for is one of the highest titles you can have, like a decorated general. Yeah. Eutuekong, you know we love you, but please don't say that again. I was shocked. I'm like, I thought I was doing good. The guy said, you have what to eat we don't have. If you tell them that and they do it, you will not come off food from our mouth. It had to do with security. Mm. He said, if there is peace, there are things that will fall out. They what you call the inevitable concomitant. Let me tell you something. The police is not as stupid as you are, as we think. Sorry, did I say just, just uh, as we think they are? They are not. Everything they are doing is very deliberate to a great extent, very intentional. And my apology to the very, 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 a committed, passionate few, because they are there. So I don't want to carry this brush and paint everybody. There are people there who are they are they are upright, but the generality of the police are not taken care of by government. They are taking care of themselves, and they are like instead of having like uh, I want to get very graphic, instead of eating like. Um, two or three pieces of meat. They are packing 20 pieces of meat on the plate. And common sense tells you that there is no way you can finish 20 pieces of meat. Why am I saying this? Insecurity, police, community policing. Number one, why can't we have the police leave private citizens as has been requested once, twice, thrice, even by the president and everybody? Why is it not happening? You know why? Because being guard to private citizens puts a lot of money in the pocket of the orgas. That is why they will hardly agree to withdraw the pleas from the private citizens and companies so that we will have more of them guiding Nigerians, a private enterprise. Secondly, I give them an idea because each time I come, I don't just want to be an analyst. I want to be able to put an idea forward. Think of this, my brother, even if we end on this. Think of this, that today the Nigerian police decides that they are going to commission private security at a certain level, highly trained. So they are going to set up a section where they are 
going to give the level of training that they can carry a certain level of light arms. You talk of the, there's this uh, national defense, no, I'm not talking of national defense, I'm talking of private security like we see outside, private investigators, and train these people. They will network, these people will network and send people to Israel and to different places. And when they come out, the Nigerian police has a section, you know what, number one, they will make money by licensing these people. They will make money. Number two, these people will recruit people, including, you know, retired generals, you know, the, the veterans, they will recruit them. So there will be employment created. Number three, the pool of police that have been with them will come back to join the ones uh, guarding the citizens, plus the new set of people, so that security will be beefed up from all sides. Government makes more money. The police will join, they come out and guide us some more, and then there will be new security people under the very special units of the Nigerian police, where they are very, very strictly monitored. And because they are such professionals, they are able to prove to Shell, prove to Chevron, prove to Total, well, all those that are not there, Proof to Cadbury, proof to you know Orlando, proof to NDDC and all these NDDC governments, you know, that they have the competencies. And as a result, Nigeria will become better policed while we are there at that top level. These are the people that are going to even help to set up with their own local, you know, policies because the Alga is within the locals and they want to know that they, they have mapped the locals so that they can have good intel and then we now have a synergy. It is not impossible, but at that point, it is no longer as lucrative to the leadership. Number three, I wanted to be the governor of Akwaibong State and probably because of time we may end on this. I don't know, but it's up to you. I wanted to be the governor of Akwaibong State and Akwaibong is one of the most peaceful states, but I wanted to even take it a notch higher by doing what? Akwaibong has 200, 329, you know, wards, taking to about 368. But let, so I mapped Akwaibong into 500 units, concentric circles, because Though it is 300 and uh, say 68, uh, there are certain places where either within the city where there's need for more concentration or what you may call ungoverned spaces. And what was I to do? Each of them, the 500 units and points, were to be covered by drones. Drones. You have a thousand five hundred specialized drones, so that each of the units has. A, a two operational and a one backup. And if there's anything, another one comes in. So that the whole state is covered. We call it the state eye. I set this up even to the national, called the national eye. Nigeria can be mapped into, if I can do that as a governor, the federal government can map Nigeria such that though we have, you know, 779 words, if you have 10 per word, 7,000, double that, about 15,000 units. You see that Sambisa forest? When they know that there is a drone overhead and that if there's anything, all we need is not police being told and they start to run. While you are trying to deploy the army, then the drone is there tracking the movement. And how many drones can you shoot down? And besides the operation of the drone, you know, they, they are, these are things that are there. Technology, it's, it is no rocket science. You don't, know, you, don't, you don't need to reinvent it. They are there. They have drones that can cover a kilometer. They are drones that can cover more than a kilometer. They are drones that can operate at different levels. When they know that you are going to track them, those trackers are sending intel to the police on ground so they know exactly where to go and not the one that by the time you go to the, you know, the, to the scene of the accident, of, of the incident, the thing had already happened, and they have already gone. They now send people, uh, uh, army there, or police there, and they will be there for another two weeks. When the, uh, he doesn't, to me, it doesn't uh, quite uh, uh, add up. Anyway, these are things that can be done with little money. And I believe that the, the federal governments, they can take some of these pieces, map Nigeria into 15,000, you know, you know, concentric circles, and then station your drones 
you employ a lot of young people. These young people are technologically savvy. That creates another employment for them. They are in their rooms, and you don't know where they are rooms because they are undercover agents. Do you understand me? There's a way you train them so that nobody knows who they are or where they are or how they are. There's a mapping you do, and at the end of the day, you can actually stay in one state and cross, you know, cross, um, you know, um, monitor, you know, another, so that nobody really tells it is from this place that they are doing that. When, when, when these criminals know that, the criminals are the most fearful people. You may not understand unless you were young, but old enough to be there in the days of Anini. And then he terrorized Nigeria, and he looked like Rambo, like you know, invincible. The day he was caught, I was so ashamed of him. When I saw him on television, please don't kill me. Please don't. I said, is this Anini? Or is this another person? When they confirmed this, I you mean, I expected a guy that said, put the bullet there, blow it off. I don't care. You do the crime, you do the time. And here he was, please don't kill me. These guys are fearful people. And all you need to do is to show them that you are coming for them and Nigeria will be in peace in less than six months. Yeah, uh, I remember the day he was caught. Uh, I remember someone was reading the news at nine and they brought a paper to the person, the newscaster. It wasn't part of the lineup and it was written there, Anini incorporated and liquidated, something like that. So I remember quite vividly what is what was said. You um, remember? <laughs> yes. So well, that means you don't belong to JSP. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I am also belonging to the um, the BBC, the Born Before Computer. That that's for what I belong to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now there are so many interesting topics, um, uh, headlines that I would have wanted us to take, but we have like just five minutes, and uh, let me just mention them. Maybe you take your pick for the f next. Uh, five minutes and let's see how we can do. Uh, one of them is that one in every 10 extremely poor people live in Nigeria, says World Bank. Then we also have northern groups tackle Tinubu over withdrawal of three nations from ECOWAS. The third one is Rev set December 2025 to deliver new constitution. Then a worrisome one here is that women protesters in Nasarawa to pay 500,000 Naira bill after 12 days incarceration. These are, these are people, this is the same, uh, the, the Guardian, uh, these are people who protested and then they were incarcerated and they had to pay, to pay 500,000 Naira. And then poor preparation, logistics, stall student loan scheme. These are all headlines that I would have wanted us to talk on, but because we have very limited time, I'd like you to take your pick. Whether one in every 10 extremely poor live in Nigeria, according to World Bank, or the fact that uh, northern groups are tackling Tinubu over withdrawal of three nations from ECOWAS, they say it's a security threat anyway. And Rep said uh, December 2025 to deliver new constitution. And then the Nasarawa women who protested that are supposed to pay 500,000 Naira bill, or poor preparation, logistics, stall, student loan scheme. Take your pick, sir. You are being so unfair to me. <laughs> because each of those, I'll just I'll tell you, I'll just say a word. Number one, my heart goes out to the women of Nasarawa State. We all know what happened in Nasarawa State. We all know what happened. We all know what happened. And it's a sin in the first instance for you to carry those women and incarcerate them even for, for one hour. And then you now turn around to ask them to bail themselves. I, I think that whoever, I think that the federal government should, the attorney general of the federation should look at that case and make sure that it's not true because it will be, it will be, I don't want to use the word unfortunate. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, it will be, it will be, I don't know, <clears throat> the, the word I would like to use is not good. So I'm sure he, you get what I'm talking, he gets mm. what I'm saying. Yeah. Get those women released today or before this afternoon, I beg you. <clears throat> Number two, loan scheme is not a student's loan scheme. You know, my heart is there with the young people. Yeah. It's not um, from day one. I felt scandalized by the amount that they set up for the loan scheme. And then you cannot just make announcements without the necessary infrastructure. Tell us, <clears throat> I am going to do this. 
and I've set up the next three months to get a report on it. But my intention is to make sure that there is adequate loan scheme for young people because for their education, because we can't continue this way. They need to be helped. That's enough. Three months time, you come up and tell us. You look for the way the money is. You look at how the modalities will be. And that is where a system works. Number three, ECOWAS. You see, this, um, for me, the worrisome part is our borders with some of them. If they were like a distant, um, uh, not as if it's okay, I, I would not be as bothered as the fact that once there's a diplomatic row between the two nations, uh, uh, two nations that share border, then there is a technical problem. And I do not know how that is going to be resolved. Let me not leave them, um, go back to that. Let me end on, there's one of me, but one in 10 Nigeria, a poor person lives in Nigeria. I believe that that's a statement that should not be the case at the end of this year. If there's a statement that should provoke the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, let that be that statement. Because it's a shame. It's unacceptable. It is scandalous. It is absolutely preposterous for a nation like Nigeria. And when I say a nation like Nigeria, I know what I'm talking about. Technically, we're a very poor country. Very poor country. But in real terms, we are one of the richest countries in the world. What makes a country rich? Two things, human resources, number two, material resources or natural resources, amongst others. Please name one country in the world that is more endowed than Nigeria in terms of natural resources. Anywhere. Come to, look, I get angry that I ate papa in my house and threw it away and traveled. And by the time I came back, I find... 10 stands of popo, and I'm like, what's, don't they know that this is my field? How can popo grow here? What is their own? I am angry that a seed I threw on the floor is growing. Whereas in some countries, for that popo to grow, they will need to consult the gods. They will need to treat the soil. They will need to, so that's the sort of soil we have in Nigeria. And then we're a poor country. Secondly, human resources. I've traveled around the world. I, I can't tell how many times I travel and where I can, I've not been to. There's hardly any place in the world you go to and at the top you don't find a Nigerian. Hardly. We are so cerebral. We are so industrious. We are so endowed. We are so intelligent. We are so... I, I, everything. Nigeria, okay. apart from the Jews, I believe that we are the most endowed people in the whole world. Okay. And then combine those two, leave others. And that same country is one of the rich, is a poverty capital of the world. Yeah. It's an error. 10% of the extremely poor people live in Nigeria. Well, we'd like to thank you. Uh, uh, we will leave the constitution matter to, to another time because our time is up right now. Since they say 2025, there's still more time to talk about it. And we do hope that uh, w the critical elements within the constitution are the ones that are going to be touched. Not just that they're going to do a shoddy job that will My brother, the require Senate them president to come back there, so again. So we talk that okay. one. Let's just leave that. No, I said my brother is the president. Today, so we'll talk that one, you know, behind closed doors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you so much for being a part of our program this morning, Architect. Thank you. God bless you. You too. Uh, we'll be talking with architect Ezekiel Nyaitok. Uh, he's a public affairs analyst talking to us from uh, Akwa Ibom State on uh, a, um, Off the Press. That's the segment that we had him join us. We'll take a very short break. When we return, we'll be looking at the issues at the Methodist School uh, with the church and uh, what is happening in the land. Okay, so we'll just take that moment now. Stay with us. <laughs>